and Henry needed a son to inherit the throne. His eldest was named Arthur. This child of the blood royal was to be linked not just to the Plantagenets, but to patriotic English legends. But Arthur died in 1502, leaving his younger brother Henry as the Tudor heir. And in 1509, when the 52-year-old king died, Henry VIII succeeded to the throne. He was the perfect king, a king out of the storybooks. He was 17 years old, extremely well-educated, extremely good-looking, with polished manners and the style and physique of an athlete. He also had an unchallengeable claim to the crown. And to secure the succession, Henry VIII married the woman to whom he'd been betrothed for seven years, Catherine of Aragon, his dead brother's widow. The Spanish worried that this was against church rules, and so the Pope granted a dispensation. In fact, this was all rubbish. While the Bible specifically forbids a man from sleeping with his brother's wife, it actually insists that he must marry his brother's widow. Anyhow, two years later, Catherine gave birth to a son. But the infant soon died. So did the next. In fact, the marriage only produced one child that lived, a girl called Mary. Henry was effectively all-powerful. There were no great barons anymore in England, and his father had left a well-stocked treasury. Parliament consisted, to a large extent, of men who depended one way or another on royal favour, and the countryside was controlled by justices of the peace who served the government. You can see the change in the very nature of power from the home of Henry's Chancellor. Fifty years earlier, Edward IV's Chancellor had been a Neville, the son of the Earl of Salisbury. In those days, an Englishman's home had been his castle. Middleton Castle, actually. It was his father's home, and that great lord had also been Chancellor. Independently powerful men, based in a mighty fortified palace. But under the Tudors, the great power of the Nevilles had been broken. Middleton Castle was in the hands of the king. When Henry VIII's Chancellor Wolsey built himself a home, it certainly wasn't a castle. It was this magnificent palace, Hampton Court. Glass windows instead of arrow slits and chimneys instead of crenellations. No one needed a fortified house under the protection of a great king. And it was all at Henry's pleasure. If Wolsey didn't deliver what the king wanted, he was entirely dispensable. And that, of course, is what happened. The royal marriage was haunted by the ghost of their dead sons. By the end of the 1520s, Catherine was in her late 40s, had stopped getting pregnant, and there was still no male heir, just a daughter, and England had never been ruled by a woman. Henry, determined to have a male heir, must get rid of his wife. Then he would be free to take a younger bride and make a baby boy. The bride in question, Anne Boleyn, was already well installed in Henry's life. Henry, who'd already enjoyed her sister as his mistress, had wooed Anne with enthusiasm. He married her in 1533. Her coronation didn't seem to impress Londoners. Their entwined initials on the banners produced shouts of, Ha ha! She was visibly pregnant and gave birth to a child. Drat! Another girl! She was named Elizabeth, and little Mary was declared illegitimate. The legality of this marriage must be sorted out before her next baby. That was Wolsey's job. He had to persuade the Pope that his predecessor should never have allowed the marriage to Catherine. Henry fancied himself as a theologian. He'd written an attack on Luther, which became a bestseller, and the Pope had declared him a defender of the faith. A proud boast, which he stuck on the coinage, and has remained there ever since. Every English monarch is fit death. So he told Wolsey exactly how the argument should be put to the Pope. Wolsey could probably have swung it if he'd been left alone. As it was, he failed and lost his job. And the Pope had also failed. So Henry, the defender of the faith, fired the Pope. To achieve this drastic act, having himself legally declared the supreme head of the church in England, required an extraordinary shift in power. He had to find a way of giving the nation a voice so that it could say, 
what he wanted. That way was through Parliament. The church's wealth and power was hugely unpopular. The notion of no longer paying church taxes to Rome was really very cheery. But it wasn't as simple as that. Some people believed that the Pope really did represent divine authority. And for many others, there was a fear that the Pope might excommunicate their customers on the continent if they continued trading with them. With the effective help of a new chief minister, Thomas Cromwell, and a new Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Cranmer, Parliament passed the necessary acts. By the end of 1534, the King of England had become, legally, the total, overall, supreme ruler of the whole shebang. Once Henry VIII had become head of the church in England, he was a new kind of king. One immediate consequence of the new order was that he had control of the fabulous wealth of the English church. It wasn't just the Pope who got the sack. He closed down all the monasteries and nunneries. There weren't all that many people in them, less than 10,000 over the whole country, but there may have been ten times that number dependent on them. And in areas such as Lincolnshire and Northumberland, there was armed rebellion. One of the rebel leaders was John Neville from that great old family of barons. But the Nevilles were no threat to the modern crown. The rebellions were crushed. And monastic lands were sold off cheap to bolster the treasury, make Henry more popular, and allow successful businessmen to turn themselves into grateful country gentry who would loyally support the crown. The old struggle for power between the papacy and the monarchy had now been decisively settled. Becket, the 12th century archbishop whose defense of church power had led to his martyrdom, had been the most popular saint in England. Henry ordered Becket to be declared no saint, to be tried and convicted of treason, and for his bones to be burned and the dust scattered in the air. Who's in charge now, eh? What's more, in 1536, Catherine of Aragon died, meaning that the problem of the ex-queen had gone away. He and Anne Boleyn dressed in bright yellow to celebrate. But four months later, he was told that Anne had committed adultery. Henry was surrounded by courtiers jockeying for influence, forming alliances, factions, to do down those who might damage them. And Anne became a victim of an organized campaign by those who felt endangered by her faction. Whether it was true or not, no one knows, because Henry's fury was so total that her trial and those of her supposed lovers was a travesty. She might indeed get pregnant with a boy, but then its parentage would be in doubt, and she might not. She'd miscarried at least twice since Elizabeth's birth. Without a legitimate son, it had all been for nothing. Anne was imprisoned in the royal lodgings in the Tower of London. Henry had extended them before their coronation, and now she was occupying them for the first time. Not as his wife, but as his prisoner. After 18 days, she was beheaded, and Henry married Jane Seymour. England after the death of Anne Boleyn was a kingdom like no other. Henry ruled in England as head of the church as well as king, like some pagan priest king. He was the judge of heresy as well as crime. He held the keys to heaven as well as to earthly promotion. That chap in the Vatican was now just referred to as the Bishop of Rome. To even think the wrong thoughts in this kingdom could be treason. That was how the new chancellor, Thomas Moore, found himself imprisoned in the bell tower of the Tower of London. Not for what he did, or even what he said, but for thinking that the king should not be head of the church. He was publicly executed on Tower Hill. Henry was terrifying, magnificent, generous, dangerous, and in most people's eyes, the best king England had seen in a very long time. And Jane had a son, Edward. Sadly, she died in childbirth, but the throne was safe. His only problem was abroad, and by 1539, it did begin to look as though the Bishop of Rome might be lining up some muscle against him. But there were now well-established and powerful Protestant princes in Germany, and on the fine old principle that my enemy's enemy is my friend, Henry married into their world. He got Anne of Cleves for a wife. 